Some people here probably think I'm come to defend the industry, so I'll tell you the title of my talk, Reflections on Corporate Smoke and Mirrors. That's what I'm calling this. To protect the offshore, or the environment generally, you have to understand the arguments used by, by the industry to justify their large and risky, and therefore large risk, projects. Despite mounting evidence to the contrary, the corporations insist that the benefits outweigh the costs. As an economist, it's frustrating to read environmental assessments because of the abuse of economics that goes on in those things. The proponents justify their projects by invoking economic benefits, jobs, local spin-offs, tax revenues, and exports. These are either irrelevant or inflated, and sometimes both, but at the same time, the costs of the environment are downplayed or ignored. First, I want to distinguish between economic and financial. Economics <laughs> is how we use our resources, natural resources, human resources, our built environment, to meet our needs. Financial studies are about money flows, about where the money goes for the corporation, to profits, to stock prices, to executive pay, regardless of what happens to real resources or to the abuse of those resources in order to boost the bottom line of the corporations. Economists are berated for measuring everything in terms of money. We fit um, Oscar Wilde's definition of a cynic. We know the price of everything and the value of nothing. That's not strictly true. Competent economists know that you have to have a measure of things to compare things. That the market economy does not place a value, a price, on the things that we value most. Community, equity, the environment, well-being. And therefore, we have to find some way to infer the value of those things in order to make it clear what we are giving up when we do things like the offshore. So the measures we develop are admittedly crude, but nonetheless, what, they, what we are doing is trying to value what we call externalities, that the environment and people's health and a lot of things that we value are not part of the market deal that you make when you buy a product. They're external to the market transaction, but the real costs. And these external costs can be significant Got it up there yet? Could you throw the, the one up, please? Many of you know that the fossil fuel industry is heavily subsidized to the tune of about $1.4 billion a year in Canada. But the externalities involved are much greater. So what I've got here is a, is a quote taken from a report by a fellow called Mitchell showing that the IMF has estimated that the costs of the fossil fuel industry in Canada, when you include those externalities, however crude our measure of them are, is it amounts to something like $50 billion. So I'll just, I'll just point out that what he's saying there is that we try to measure these costs, these externalities, and then the IMF breaks them down to show you how you've got the $1.4 billion in actual subsidies to the industry, but on top of that, you can break down the various costs of the externalities to get some sense of where they're coming from uh, and how much they are. Now, you can debate about how accurate these are, but when they're 34 times the actual financial subsidies we give to the corporations, there's a lot of room for saying, hey, they're huge. So my first critique of the corporate submissions in the environmental assessments is that they focus almost entirely on the money, the financial flows and the market valuations, and they leave out what is most important to society, but not to the corporations. The second critique, critique, critique is the corporate misuse of economics in presenting the so-called benefits. Now the first comment I'm going to make, we could spend an hour debating, but I'm going to make it walk away from it. <laughs> the first point about jobs is this. They are not the justification for a project. 
If jobs make something good, then war is good. Hurricanes are good. Fires are good. You can't use jobs as a benefit. Okay. But that's what the companies do. And of course, when they put the job estimates in, they're generally overstated, often by some multiple of what actually turns out. The assumption of the companies and of the politicians is that only jobs matter. I will direct you, or I will suggest to you, that you read only one part of the Ibany report, and that is on page 226. Skip over the other stuff. <laughs> And if they get some survey results on page 226, they ask people on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 means highest ranking, do you agree with the statement that the environment takes precedence over jobs? In Nova Scotia, in 2014, when the survey was done, on a scale of zero to 10, that scored eight. That tells you that people have got a lot of common sense. And when you listen to the government advocating projects or the companies advocating projects, think about that fact. The interesting thing about it, second interesting thing about it is that that score of eight is high in the rural areas which have real job and economic problems as well as in the urban centers, which are doing all right. That is crucial. People are already on side. There's another part of the jobs question, which is crucial in the fossil fuels industry, and that is energy is the most capital intensive industry in Canada. By capital intensive, I mean for every worker working in the industry, they take a lot of capital equipment, capital expenditure, per job. And it means then that the number of jobs that you get, for instance, when you sell a million dollars worth of oil offshore, the number of jobs involved in creating that is about one-fifth of the average in Canada. So when they talk about jobs in this industry, they're talking about very few jobs relative to the investments that they will be making in it. That also means then that the job impacts are going to be relatively small locally, particularly in the development stage of the offshore. The capital equipment is imported, so there are no jobs in creating the capital. The workers in the development stage tend to be specialized, and they tend to be imported. So there are very few jobs at that stage, which is the most job intensive. But if you look at the environmental assessments of the industry, or the, excuse me, the job assessments, they'll show low local jobs initially, and then after the first year, they take off. But that's not because they hire local people. It's because in their reports, they define a Nova Scotian as someone who is resident in Nova Scotia on de December 31st of the previous year. So they bring in workers. When the January 1st comes, they are now Nova Scotians, and the estimates take off. OK, now let's talk about local spin-offs. Besides the jobs in the industry, they're supposedly spin-offs from the industry spending, from the workers spending here. The problem is, as I say, the equipment is purchased, and a lot of local expenditures which go into their assessments as local are purchases from a local seller of a huge truck or a piece of equipment. So the bulk of that money is to bring the trucker in and the equipment in to pay for that, not spent in the local economy. The local effect is sales commission and perhaps, perhaps, servicing of the equipment. So they are ignoring the outflows that they cause in terms of importing the machinery, in terms of profits flowing out, and the real benefits to the community are therefore much smaller than they project. If those workers are the specialists who are imported, 
they don't spend much locally because they're sending money home to their families so that their impact on the local economy is much different than the impact of a local person getting a job. However, the flip side of that is if you're going to get the massive jobs that the industry predicts and they come and they bring their families with them, then they impose large pressures on the housing market, schools, hospitals, and other services locally. So they may be spending their money here, but they're also forcing the community to provide a lot more service to them. And then, of course, when the development stage is over with, where do they go? They go somewhere else to another project, and then the community has to twist back into shape, or try to, because they've all gone, or the majority of them have gone. So in that sense, the local spin-offs are minim minimized in the long term. Finally, in terms of what the industry tells us, is that in their assessments, there's one little line buried in a whole bunch of accounting, which is mitigation. And these are company expenditures for mitigation. And what does mitigation mean? It means, that was five minutes. It means correcting the damage they've done, paying the court costs when they get taken to court, making compensation if they actually have to compensate for the damage they've caused. So that line mitigation, which is part of the sums that are sat added up to get the benefits to the community, that line mitigation, the bigger it is, well not the line, the sum, the bigger it is, the more damage they expect to pay for, they don't expect to pay for it all, the more damage they expect to pay for, and therefore the more harm they've done to the community. And that gets listed as an expenditure which gets thought of as a benefit. Okay, next item on their list of benefits is exports. We Canadians are supposed to be like Pavlov's dogs, and when you hear the word export, you're supposed to salivate. <laughs> <laughs> As one textbook says, exports are simply the smudge of a ship on the horizon. <laughs> Exports are something that you produce with your resources to meet someone else's need for energy. Our resources are to meet our needs. They can do so directly if we have energy resources and we use them as our energy, we have met in our energy needs. If we export them, all we get for exporting them is foreign currency, which is only good to do what? To buy foreign goods. So the reason we export is to pay for imports. And you have to ask yourself, wouldn't it be easier to produce it ourselves? And why can't our businesses figure out how to produce more things for ourselves? So the export uh, argument is problematic. Second, and I know a lot of you have had flu shots, but I'm here to talk to you about the Dutch disease. The Dutch disease was first publicly talked about in Canada under Eric Cairns 40 years ago. The fact that if you get an export, like he was talking about energy at the time, if you get an energy export, you're driving up the Canadian dollar, and therefore you make it harder for other industries to export their goods. So what you do is substitute say, a manufacturing industry in Ontario for an oil industry and tar sands industry in uh, Alberta or an offshore industry in Nova Scotia, you're driving up the currency and affecting manufacturing industries. You're exporting a product which, remember, is capital intensive, so you're creating very few jobs in the export and killing another industry which creates five or six <coughs> times as many jobs. So when they say, we need the tar sands or we need the offshore oil, for exports, and it'll create jobs, be very, very careful. It's not fantastic. <laughs> the other part of that, and the recent drop in oil prices illustrated this precisely, is that when that raw material resource is depleted, and the industry disappears, and then the exchange rate can fall, as we've seen in the last few years, <laughs> 
the industries that were hurt by that are no longer there or are in bad shape and can't respond immediately. And it was incredible to see the politicians wondering why when the exchange rate fall, fell, manufacturing didn't immediately expand because a lot of those firms have gone out of business or whatnot. So there's a short run problem and there's a long run problem and neither of them is any fun. Finally, since I've got a slide for this, I'll talk about tax revenues. We are told, and the example that, that I like to cite is AIMS. Everybody knows what AIMS stands for, the Atlantic Institute of Misleading Statistics. <laughs> <laughs> when AIMS wanted to fast track fracking, they made a big deal about all the tax revenues that fracking would provide Nova Scotia. And they argued, as many of them do, that if we would simply develop these industries, we would get all of this tax revenue from these firms, ignoring the subsidies they've got, we would get all these revenues from the firms, and we'll no longer be dependent on handouts from the federal government, the transfers that we get from the federal government. The slide down there now? Okay. Um, so the point of the revenues is that when you look at the fact that transfers, gotcha, the transfers are a two-way street, Nova Scotians actually transfer more money to the federal government than the federal government transfers into Nova Scotia. So if Ames wants to argue that there's a dependency in Canada, the federal government is dependent on us. Thank you.